Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Viv again. Today, we'll be studying this very famous uh, system known as a double pendulum. So I have built one here, although I should warn you that this is not the most general double pendulum. I have put two beads on a string with some knots on either side of the middle bead so that the uh, middle bead doesn't move much. So this is what you can think of as a double pendulum. And what we are trying to do is analyze how the system moves. Now, the reason I said this is somewhat limited is because you cannot really have angles that are too big because this thread may go slack. As a result, the real double pendulum system is usually specified with light rigid rods. So if you have light rigid rods replacing these uh, strings and then heavy, heavy point masses for the beads, then you have the uh, true double pendulum. So that's the system we are going to analyze today. We're going to be doing two kinds of problems, the one without air resistance, and we'll look at the two natural frequencies you get for the motion. And then we will add what is known as the Rayleigh dissipation term to the Lagrangian in order to get the damped equations. And the damped equations shall be solved for a very specific case, because in general, the damped equations are not easily solvable. So that's our problem for today. It's a beautiful problem and one that cannot usually be done with elementary methods that you may have learned um, in a, a lower level course. So let's proceed to solve this using Lagrangians. Uh, the X axis will be to the right. The Y axis, I'll take it to be pointing down. Now, as always, you have to take your zero for gravitational potential energy. I will take that to be the point where the pendulum is supported. And the pendulum itself, I'll take it to be two light rigid rods. Now, eventually, I will be setting the lens equal, but at least for the beginning, the lengths will be different. So I'll call this mass M1. The masses will also be different. And I'll call this mass M2 and length L2. So the appropriate coordinate system that we have with that being the origin is one where we're measuring X and Y down. So our uh, coordinate for the point M1 is gonna be X1 comma Y1. And the coordinate for the point M2 are X2 comma Y2. I will denote this by the vector R1 and this by the vector R2. To avoid clutter, I specify vectors as ordered pairs rather than using unit vectors like I hat or J hat. So immediately uh, we realize that the true stars of the show are actually angles and not uh, coordinates. So we'll call these angles theta one and theta two because theta one and theta two completely specify the location of the pendulum. So now we'll write down some equations for x1. x1 by trigonometry is L1 sine theta one. And then y1 is gonna be L1 cosine theta one. x2 will be L1 sine theta one plus L2 sine theta two. And then y2 will be L1 cosine theta one plus L2 cosine theta two. So those are the basic uh, equations we have. And so the generalized coordinates in this problem are Q1, Q2, uh, which are gonna be taken to be theta one comma theta two. Everything will be written in terms of theta one and theta two. They are our generalized coordinates. Now, the first part of the problem is to find the kinetic energy metric. So the kinetic energy term, Ke uh, term T, can be written as a metric uh, where the metric tensor is AJK, QJ dot, QK dot. And here I've used Einstein summation, which means repeated indices are summed over. 
so the metric uh, AJK can be defined as follows. It's uh, one half the mass of the ith particle, the partial derivative of the ith particle's position vector with respect to the jth generalized coordinate dot product with the partial derivative of the ith position vector divided by the kth general coordinate. So that's the general definition of a uh, kinetic energy metric. It's the components of these me this metric that we have to find. Fortunately, there are only four components. So let's get uh, busy calculating them. So the first one is gonna be a one one. So I have to put j equals one and k equals one. I, because it's an index, index that's repeated, is gonna be summed over. So this is interpreted as follows. It's one half. Let's put I equals one first. So that gives me del R1 over del, now J is one and K is one. So that's theta one dotted with del R over del theta one plus one half M2 uh, del R2 because now I have uh, this i equals one here and now i equals uh, uh, two, the j and k don't change. So that's del r two over del theta one. Now I'm gonna use a convention to save space of uh, c equals cosine and s equals sine. So since we have our, um, X, uh, R1 is X1 comma Y1 and X1 is L1 sine theta one and X, uh, Y1 is L1 cosine theta one. So let me um, write one preliminary step, one half M1. So this is gonna be del by del theta one of R1, which is L1 sine theta one comma L1 cosine theta one, that is the first term, dotted with the same thing. And the next term is gonna be one half M2 del by del theta one of R2. Now R2 is X2 comma Y2 and X2 and Y2 are here. So I'll write them as well. Uh, for X2, I'm gonna write L1 sine theta one plus L2 sine theta two comma Y1, which is L1 cosine theta one plus L2 cosine theta two dotted with the same thing. Um, so del by del uh, theta one, the same thing. Comma. So this is just a bunch of differentiation and then taking the dot products. So it's really not uh, deep at all. So let's do the um, differentiation. If you notice, this becomes cosine, that becomes negative sine, and the same thing there. So I get one half M1, L1 cosine theta one, comma negative L1 sine theta one, dotted with L1 cosine theta one, comma negative, L1 sine theta one, and then this bigger term, plus one half M2. Here, I'll get contributions only from this because there is no theta, um, <clears throat> there's no dependence of theta two on theta one. Theta one and theta two are independent completely. So this term is gonna be zero. I'll write the zero initially, just to make sure we all are on the same page. So that's cosine theta one, plus zero, 
comma negative L1 sine theta one plus zero uh, dotted with the same thing. <clears throat> so we have pretty much finished it. The dot product is just gonna be squared and then that's gonna be also squared. A dot product of two vectors is the i component multiplies together plus the j components multiply together. That's what we're gonna do next. So that's one half m1, uh, l1 squared, cosine squared theta one plus the minus sign disappears because two minuses make a plus, l1 squared sine squared theta one. And then here I have one half m2, l1 squared cosine squared theta one plus l1 squared sine squared theta one. So that's very good because sine squared plus cosine squared is just one. And so I have one half m1 l1 squared plus one half m2 l2 squared, which is one half m1 plus m2 l1 squared. That's great. So we have got the first uh, term of the metric. We need three more terms. So let's do them. A12. And here I'm gonna use a property of the metric tensor to cut down the calculation. A12 will be the same as A21 by symmetry. You can see that that's obviously true. Uh, if this is one um, and two, I'm basically having the same numerator terms but one and two are getting interchanged. The dot product is symmetric. So I'll just do one of them. So I'll just do A12. So that's gonna be one half M1 del R1 over del theta one dot del R1 over del theta two. This time um, J is a one and K is two. So the denominator changes. The numerator is just summed over. So that's one half M2 del r um, two over del theta one dotted with del r two over del theta two. Now what we uh, will do is we'll just look at this, but take the derivatives accordingly. So that gives me one half m one del r one over del theta one I just did there. So I'll just copy down the result, it's this one. So that's l one cosine theta one comma negative L1 sine theta one dotted with del R1 over del R uh, del theta two. Well, R1 simply does not have any theta two. So that's zero comma zero. And then the second term is gonna be one half M2. Now del R2 over del theta one, that is R2. Uh, but that's just the first term that we did there. So I'll copy that one down, L1 cosine theta one. I won't write the plus zero this time, comma negative L1 sine theta one dotted with, now we have del R2 over del theta two. Well, that's only gonna see the theta two terms and it's not gonna see the theta one terms. Again, I'll suppress writing the zeros. So I'll just get L2 cosine theta two, comma negative L2 sine theta two. Now, all I would have to do is take the dot products of uh, these vectors. So let me do that next. I get, um, first of all, the first term is zero, zero plus one half M2. And this one is gonna be L1, L2, cosine theta one, cosine theta two, plus L1, L2, sine theta one, sine theta two. Uh, I can take a L1, L2 outside. And then I have cosine theta one, cosine theta two, plus sine theta one, sine theta two. If you remember your trigonometry, that's just cosine of theta one minus theta two, the so-called addition formula. And since A21 is the same, we have finished three components and we only have the last one to compute. Let's do that. That's A22. Well, that's gonna be one half M1 uh, del R1 over del theta two dot del R1 over del theta two plus one half M2. This time J and K are both two. So the denominator is always two. Uh, 
you'll notice that R1 does not have any theta two. So that's just gonna be zero comma zero. Um, so, I mean, it's a zero plus zero, I should say, when you take the dot product. And then I get plus one half M2, uh, del R2 over del theta two, we just did there. So I'll copy down that result. Uh, that's just uh, L2 cosine theta two, comma negative L2 sine theta two, and uh, dotted with itself. All right, that's the last term. That's one half M2 L2 squared cosine squared theta two plus L2 squared sine squared theta two. Then again, using our beloved property of cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, I'm gonna get one half M2 L2 squared. So we have here in this, this manner, we have found all the components of the metric. So the answer to our first uh, problem is done. So let's assemble all of the components of the metric in one big matrix. So that's um, how the metric tensor is usually written. That's a big matrix. So the matrix A uh, i j is gonna be, there's one half from all three terms. So I'll take the one half outside and then I get M1 plus M2 L1 squared, and then here, the middle term is gonna be M2, L1, L2, cosine of theta one minus theta two. So the metric does depend on the generalized coordinates. This makes this problem highly nonlinear, and in what follows, in order to even make any kind of headway, we will have to resort to small angle approximations. So we have found the kinetic energy metric. Uh, now I pointed out earlier that the kinetic energy term is that. So we'll substitute that into the Lagrangian. So the next step is to solve the Lagrangian. L is T minus V. The kinetic energy term is just Aij, uh, qi dot, qj dot, using the Einstein summation, the potential energy term becomes positive because uh, it, uh, anything down is, according to this convention, if ug equal to zero, uh, anything up is positive, anything down is negative. So the potential energy is negative, but it comes with a negative sign. So negative of a negative is positive. So the potential energy term becomes plus uh, m1 gy1, plus M2G Y2. Now all we have to do is substitute for the metric and the potential energy terms, and we have our um, Lagrangian set up. So let me write this down. Using the metric, I'm gonna get one half M1 plus M2 times L1 squared theta one dot squared because the first term will be one one and then q one dot q two q one dot and q one dot is just theta one dot uh, the one two term will have theta one dot theta two dot uh, but since you have one two and two one to be the same they will add together and these halves will disappear and you'll just get m2 l1 l2 cosine of theta one minus theta two times theta one dot, theta two dot. And then lastly, one half M2 uh, L2 squared, theta two dot squared. So that finishes the potential, uh, the kinetic energy term. The potential energy term is M1 G Y1, which is L1 cosine theta one, and then M2 times G of Y2, Y2 is that. So that's uh, L1 cosine theta one plus L2 cosine theta two. So that's a monstrous Lagrangian. And this is where we decide to make approximations because we're gonna have to make them 
anyway down the line. So why not make them early on so everything can be more manageable? So that's going to be our strategy. Uh, the approximations we're going to make are um, indicated here. Uh, equal mass, equal length, without air resistance, uh, and natural frequencies. So we're going to also get use some small angle approximations along the way. But first, let's do the equal mass, e equal length. So say m1 equals m2 equals m, and l1 equals l2 equals l. So straight away, you know, it's not the pendulum I showed you because the two masses have to be equal and the two lengths have to be equal. Now that makes it enormously simple because this M1 plus M2 is just 2M and that two cancels the half. So the Lagrangian now becomes ML squared. I don't write L1 anymore. Uh, theta one dot squared plus ML squared. L1 and L2 are both L. Uh, cosine theta one minus theta two. Uh, theta one dot, theta two dot, plus one half m l squared, theta two dot squared. And here I have two of these same things because now m1 is equal to m2. So I'll combine them as mgl times two cosine theta one plus cosine theta two. Much more pleasant looking. But you'll notice this ML squared term is uh, kind of an annoying um, thing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define a new Lagrangian L tilde, which is the original Lagrangian divided by ML squared. So I'll call this the specific Lagrangian, which means the specific Lagrangian in this case is Lagrangian per unit moment of inertia. So Lagrangian per unit moment of inertia. ML squared has got the units of moment of inertia. It's just something I decide to invent off the bat just to make my life easy. So now let's write the specific Lagrangian after having divided it like that. L tilde is gonna now be theta one dot squared, very pretty, uh, plus cosine theta one minus theta two, uh, theta one dot, theta two dot, uh, plus one half, theta dot, two dot squared. And now, unfortunately, when I do ML squared here, M and L cancel, but there's one L I'm canceled. What that, uh, what that does is it goes to the denominator. So I'm going to get G over L. But G over L is the square of the frequency of a simple pendulum. Uh, of length L. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna call this plus omega P squared times two cosine theta one plus cosine theta two. In graduate physics, you should be very free with inventing new symbols to make your life easy. So omega P is the square root of G over L. And that is the uh, signature frequency or natural frequency of a a uh, simple pendulum. So I'll write that here. It's natural frequency of a simple pendulum. Of length L. So that's nice. You're getting all the answers in terms of like the basic at atomic oscillator and the atomic oscillator in this case is a simple pendulum. All right, so now let's write the equations according to Mr. Lagrange. The equations of Lagrange are two in number. There's a theta one equation uh, that tells me that d by dt uh, del L tilde over del theta one dot minus del L tilde over del theta one equals zero. So we'll look at this Lagrangian over here, the specific Lagrangian L tilde and write down each of these terms. So del L by del theta one dot, I see a theta one dot there, I see one here and that's it, two terms. So I'm gonna get two theta one dot 
plus cosine theta one minus theta two, uh, theta two dot. And then that's a negative sign, but when I take the derivative with respect to theta one, because of a cosine, cosine derivative is negative sign. So I'm anticipating that and writing plus already. So that gives me two omega pendulum squared sine theta one equals zero. Well, that's still fairly complicated. So now let's take the d by dt into each term. So I'm gonna get, uh, first I'm gonna get two theta double dot and then negative. When I do cosine, I get negative sine theta one minus theta two. And then by the chain rule, I have to multiply that with theta one dot minus theta two dot times theta two dot. And then if I didn't do that, then I go, go and directly differentiate that. So that's the next term in Leibniz's rule, theta two double dot. So you can see it's pretty complicated stuff. So that's what I have. And now I'm gonna make approximations. The approximations I'll uh, make are as follows. I'm gonna say that uh, sine theta is approximately equal to theta in radians, of course. Uh, the other approximation I'm gonna make is uh, theta one is uh, approximately theta one dot squared is uh, approximately zero. And that's the same as theta two dot squared. And that's the same as theta one dot theta two dot. So all terms with double derivatives, uh, derivative squared are zero, double derivatives will keep. So that, that's the assumption we're gonna make. So this term completely vanishes. I have this term. And then because uh, angles are small, I'm also gonna use cosine theta one minus theta two is approximately one. Because if the angles are small, cosine of uh, theta is approximately one. So once we have that, I just have this beautiful, really super simple uh, differential equation. It's completely linear too. Uh, two theta one double dot plus uh, theta two double dot plus two omega p squared theta one equals zero. This linear equation though is coupled. Coupled means you have reference to both theta one and theta two in the same equation. So we are still not in the realm of a stupid easy. It's easy, but not too easy. Now we'll do the theta two equation next. All I have to do is replace theta one dot by theta two dot in the um, specific Lagrangian. Uh, this time I see this term and this term for the um, theta two dot. And then I see this term for theta two. So let me write that. So I'm gonna get uh, d by dt of uh, cosine theta one minus theta two, theta one dot plus theta two dot. When I do that, I lose the half. And then I have omega p squared times sine theta two equals zero. And once again, we'll um, unwrap the d by dt first. So that gives me negative sine theta one minus theta two. Uh, then I get theta one dot minus theta two dot times theta one dot. And then I go and differentiate that. So that gives me cosine of theta one minus theta two, theta two double dot. And then this term remains omega p squared sine theta two equals zero. Now we do our small angle magic. These terms disappear, the cosine disappears, and uh, I just have, uh, I didn't do this term. So that's kind of important. So that's plus theta two double dot. When I do the d by dt of that. So I get um, the second coupled equation. I get theta, uh, that's a theta one double dot there. I'm discovering that now. So when cosine becomes one, that's theta one double dot. Then I have a theta two double dot. 
and then I have this omega p squared. This term disappears because theta one dot squared and theta two dot theta one dot times theta two dot is all zero. So then I have omega p squared theta two equals zero. That's my second coupled equation. Very pretty. One and two can be now solved. The way you solve coupled differential equations uh, is using matrix methods. So let's uh, go through them. Okay. Try to use a different color for that. Now, before we get into matrix methods, let's uh, find out, we are gonna anticipate that it's gonna oscillate. Why? Because from daily experience, we experience, uh, expect there's be a beautiful oscillation of this pendulum. Let me see if I can find this uh, pendulum here. For very small angles, I expect this to have a nice oscillation. So it's gonna keep coming back to itself. So I'm gonna try an oscillatory recipe. Uh, when you try something, it's called an Ansatz in German. So we're gonna use what's called the Euler Ansatz. The Euler Ansatz is theta one must be some angle theta one zero times e to the i omega t, where omega is the oscillation frequency we're gonna to try to find. And theta two is gonna be theta two zero times e to the i omega t. In uh, physics, we always use complex numbers to have instead of sine and cosine, it's uh, far superior to use complex numbers. When you take the first derivative, let's do the first derivative, theta one dot, I'll get the i omega down times theta one dot uh, naught e to the i omega t. Similarly, theta two dot will be i omega theta two zero e to the i omega t. When I take a second derivative, look at the magic, theta one double dot, I'll pull another i omega down, but i times i is negative one. i is the square root. As you all know, this is complex numbers. i is the square root of minus one. So when you have i squared, it's negative one. So that gives me negative omega, theta one zero, e to the i omega t, and theta two double dot, is also gonna be negative uh, omega squared, excuse me. Uh, negative omega squared, theta two zero, e to the i omega t. So that is what we're gonna input in there and see what we get. So our Euler ansatz, when inputted in equation one, gives me negative, because of that negative sign there, uh, two theta one zero omega squared, negative theta two zero omega squared, plus two omega p zero uh, theta one zero, all times e to the i omega t equals zero, but e to the i omega t is not zero, so we can divide it out. And so I get that as my first equation. The second equation is similarly minus theta one zero omega squared minus theta two zero uh, omega squared plus omega p squared theta two zero equals zero. This can be put in matrix form. So this is the same as uh, negative two omega squared plus omega uh, two omega p squared and I have negative omega squared, negative omega squared, and then negative omega squared plus omega p squared. So you can see how the symmetry in the metric manifests itself as the symmetry in the eigenvalue equation we have here. Uh, these are known as eigenvalue equations, as I'm sure you all know. That's equal to zero. Now, when you have a matrix times a eigenvector equal to zero, this has non-trivial solutions by Kramer's rule, only if and only if the determinant of this matrix is zero. So let's uh, mention that little theorem from linear algebra. There exists a unique, that symbol means unique, non-trivial uh, solution, if and only if, I'll quote here Kramer's rule. Uh, Kramer's rule is sometimes spelled with a C. So in case you're trying to look it up on Wikipedia, try C also. I don't know which one uh, is correct anymore. I just remember it. So by Kramer's rule, 
uh, we're gonna have the determinant of this thing has to be zero. So I'm gonna get negative two omega squared plus uh, two omega p squared, uh, negative omega squared, negative omega squared, negative omega squared plus omega p squared equals zero. So this characteristic equation is what solves us for us the uh, frequency or natural frequencies as it's sometimes called. The word normal frequencies should not be used. Uh, we, as we'll see later in the course, normal frequencies have a very specific meaning. It means frequencies refer to normal coordinates. So we'll use the word normal um, separately from the word natural. So this gives me, uh, I have to solve this, two is common. So I'll get two times negative omega squared uh, plus omega p squared times this thing here, negative omega squared plus omega p squared minus, uh, these minuses cancel out, but there's a minus when you take the determinant uh, of a matrix. So that gives me still minus omega four equals zero. So we have to um, solve this. Now, if you notice, I can take an omega minus sign outside. I can take a minus sign outside from this. So I'm gonna get omega squared minus omega p squared here and omega squared minus omega p squared. Because I've taken a minus from both terms, I still, I still have no sign change. But you have the same terms twice. So that's the same as saying two times omega squared minus omega p squared the whole thing squared minus omega four equals zero. Now, this is not super tough, even though it looks like a quartic, it actually is not. So let's solve this, uh, a minus b squared type formula. So I get a squared minus two ab plus b squared. And then minus omega to the four equals zero. So that's the um, thing we have. Uh, two omega to the four and negative omega to the four. I get rid of one of them. So I get omega to the four minus four because two times two is four. Omega squared, omega p squared plus two uh, omega p to the power four equals zero. So that's the equation that I would have to solve. Let us start doing that. That's just a quadratic equation because even though it looks like a quartic, it's a quadratic in omega squared. So I'm gonna use a quadratic formula in exactly the same uh, manner. So just, uh, I, I, even, even though these things are uh, way uh, elementary, I still like to remind myself what the quadratic formula is just so I don't make any silly mistakes. So AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero means that x equals minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Here, a is one. Uh, so let's just say a equals one, b equals negative four omega p squared, uh, c equals two omega p to the four, and of course, x is omega squared. All right. It's like the popular saying, measure twice, cut once. Why do the same calculation hurriedly several times and get it wrong each time? Just do it once carefully. So I get omega squared, that's I'm mimicking that formula, equals negative of B plus or minus B squared. When I do B squared, I lose a negative sign. The omega p squared squared is omega p to the four uh, minus four times a is one and c is two omega so that's just eight omega p squared divided by two a which is just two that's our very pretty looking thing now uh, i have a two here i have a four there so that becomes two omega p squared and what do i have here omega p that's a power four there because i have c is to the power four so when I take the omega p4 outside, it becomes omega p squared. 16 minus eight is eight, but eight is four times two. 
I take the square root of four times two, I'm gonna get two times root two. That two will cancel with this two. So I just end up with plus or minus root two omega p squared. Beautiful. So now I have uh, two solutions. The first solution is omega squared is two plus or minus, uh, sorry, two plus root two. So the plus sign gives me the first solution and the minus sign gives me the second solution. Or the second solution is two minus root two omega p squared. Observe that both of these are positive. Two minus root two is two minus 1.4 something. And that's two plus 1.4 something. So they're both positive. So you can take a further square root. You take a further square root, I'm gonna get plus or minus square root of two plus root two omega p. And omega is plus or minus the square root of two minus root two omega p. Now frequencies can only be positive. So the negative frequencies are gonna be ruled out. So the two modes we have are omega one equals root two plus root two omega p and omega two. The second mode is gonna be plus two minus root two omega p. So we have discovered that there are two modes of oscillation. Both of these modes are bigger than a simple pendulum's mode for obvious reasons. The string length is not L, but two L, since it's L and L, and the mass is this one mass M in the middle and there's one mass M at the end. So what are these two modes? Obviously it correspond to, this is obviously bigger than the pendulum frequency and that's gonna be uh, smaller than the pendulum frequency. One of them is rather slow and the other one is rather fast. Uh, I can try to illustrate this using my uh, double pendulum, even though the mass length relationship is not accurate. So what I'll do is just to make at least the length uh, the same, I'll hold the pendulum over here. So the first mode is when both of them are oscillating in sync. That's a slower mode. The second mode is when they're oscillating against each other. So let me try to get that going. So you can see this is much faster. That's a quicker mode. And the slower mode is that. All right, so that's the, those are the two modes. So let me just draw a little diagram to illustrate my demo here. So the, uh, the, the mode, well, actually the mode one is the faster one because that's bigger than the pendulum frequency. So I'll draw this one first. Uh, so mode one is gonna be where the pendulum looks like this. It oscillates between uh, those two extremes. That's gonna be mode one. And mode two is uh, the one I just described. the one where both the pendulums are in sync. And then it goes back and forth between those two. So in this way, we have found the complete motion of uh, this system. We'll find what are called the normal modes later in the course when we study vibration theory in great detail. So we have finished two parts of the problem. We got the natural frequencies and we drew the natural modes. Now the other two parts are, I, I guarantee something that you would not have seen in elementary courses. Uh, because there's something called the Rayleigh dissipation function that I've now introduced. And from the Rayleigh dissipation function, we can then get damped equations and indicate how to solve the damped equations. So that's the next step. The subject of Rayleigh dissipation is uh, a very interesting one. Lord Rayleigh was a big contributor to dissipation theory, the velocity dissipation term is due to him. 
and he made fundamental con contributions to other areas of uh, physics, such as scattering theory. Uh, you may have heard of Rayleigh scattering. So what we're gonna do is um, add this dissipation. This is a case of damping. Damping naturally occurs in the real world because of air resistance, things like friction. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just uh, guess that the damping function is gonna be the, the so-called the Rayleigh dissipation function, sometimes called Rayleigh potential. So the Rayleigh potential is one half BV squared. The way the Rayleigh potential is defined is such that its negative gradient is the force. So let's check if the negative gradient with respect to the velocity is indeed the force. When I take the negative gradient, I'm gonna get negative BV V hat. And that is indeed the accepted form of the drag force with if drag is proportional to velocity. So we're gonna assume the simplest drag model since the motion of the pendula is so, are so slow, uh, the motion will be assumed to be proportional to the velocity and not square of the velocity or something. So that's our, our dissipation function or potential. So let's write this in terms of the variables in our problem. It's gonna be one half B. Uh, v is gonna be R1 dot squared plus R2 dot squared. Now, because I'm assuming that the masses are the same, I'm gonna assume the B coefficient for each of the spheres is the same. In other words, uh, we're not thinking about the Stokes parameters and things like that for each sphere. So we're being very simplistic about this thing. Uh, obviously you can do far more complicated analyses of this uh, problem. So um, at this point, I'll substitute for R1 and R2 uh, from what I had way back over here. So I, I, the first place I see R1 and R2 is here. So R1 is that and R2 is this one, okay? And R1 dot uh, and R2 dot are the derivatives of those things, uh, time derivatives of those things. So let me um, solve this. Um, actually, when you do that, the velocity terms are gonna be identical to what you get in the kinetic energy term because the kinetic energy terms are also differentiated. So rather than waste time going over all that, I'm simply gonna copy the kinetic energy term that we had, which is right here. So I'm gonna just copy the kinetic energy term, except instead of uh, masses, I'll just write B. So that's B one half B. I'm looking at, um, <clears throat> This one here, I can look at anyone. I'm, I look at, uh, uh, let me look at this one because I, I'm still keeping the one half outside. So one half B, when I put M1 equals M2, I'm gonna get a two. So that gives me two uh, L one squared, um, theta one dot squared plus then here, because I've taken a half outside, I'll have to put a two here. So it gives me two times L1, L2, cosine theta one minus theta two, theta one dot, theta two dot. And then here, I have taken the half outside and I just, uh, I've replaced M with B. So I get uh, L2 squared, theta two dot squared. All right, so that I'm done with that sheet. Just put this back here. This is what we're looking at next. Now, remember our earlier convention, L1 equals L2 equals L. So I'll uh, uh, pull it outside the, so I'm gonna get, uh, this is gonna be one half B L squared times, Um, let me take the one half inside. So that's uh, BL squared times theta one 
dot squared plus theta one dot theta two dot uh, cosine theta one minus theta two plus because I've taken the half inside, this becomes theta two dot squared over two. Okay, I have that. Now I define a specific Lagrangian, which is Lagrangian divided by ML squared. Let me do the same thing. The specific really dissipation function F tilde is just gonna be F divided by ML squared. I have to treat the Lagrangian and the Rayleigh dissipation function the same way. So when I do this, I'm gonna get B over M because the L squared cancels out times the same thing. I'll just write it. I'll put a cosine first. Now we have to figure out what, uh, what is this B over M. So remember the force is Mg because F equals mass times gravity. And Mg is the same as BV because the air resistance is F drag. So we have to use this to figure out what this combination B over M could be. So I have from this, the units of M times the units of G are gonna be the units of B times the units of V. So this tells me that the units of B over M are same as the units of G over V. Well, G is meters per second squared and V is meters per second. So that whole thing is one over seconds. So B over M is actually looking like a frequency. That's very good news because there is a frequency associated to any damping problem known as the damping frequency. So we're gonna anticipate that and define the damping frequency. FD, oh, actually, you know what? It's a damping angular frequency because uh, just like we got omega P, we're gonna get uh, omega here also. So I'll call this damping angular frequency. Omega damp equals B over M. So that's gonna be our new definition. All right, now let's get cracking on the modified Lagrange equations. According to Rayleigh, if you add the dissipation terms, the modified Lagrange uh, equations become the following. It's uh, d by dt uh, del L tilde over del theta one dot minus del L tilde over del theta one plus del F tilde over del theta one dot equals zero. In other words, what we had before for the undamped case will continue remaining plus there'll be a new term, which is that. Since this is the only new term, we're only gonna deal with that and not worry about anything else. So before I forget, B over M is omega D. Let's just keep that in mind. So rather than worrying about writing the whole equation, I'll just uh, write it as follows. I'll write it as what we had before plus new terms. So this gives me equation one. Uh, remember the equation one is this equation here. So what we had before, which is equation one, uh, plus the new kids on the block coming from taking the derivative of F tilde with respect to theta one dot. I get a contribution from here and a contribution from there. So let's write those contributions. I get uh, two omega D, because that's omega D, uh, theta one dot plus omega D times cosine theta one minus theta two times theta two dot. Because when I take the derivative with respect to theta one dot, I'm left with theta two dot. And that's equal to zero. Let's save that. Uh, the theta two double dot equation, the theta two equation becomes the following. It's uh, D by DT of whatever we had before, plus a new term, equals 
equals zero. So this is gonna be equation two plus additional terms. And the additional terms are got by differentiating this with respect to theta two dot. I get contribution from here and from there. Let's write those contributions down. So I get omega D from, I'll write this one first. When I take the derivative, I lose the half. So I'm just getting it omega D times theta two dot. And then here uh, I'll get omega D cosine theta one minus theta two, theta, if I take the derivative with respect to theta two dot, I'm left with theta one dot as a survivor is zero. Now we'll play the same game. Angles are small. So the small angle approximation tells me that cosine of theta one minus theta two is simply one. So equation one with dissipation, which I'll call one D. Um, so now I'll put the original equation, uh, that's equation one plus these additional terms. So I'll write down everything. Uh, so I get uh, two theta one double dot plus theta two double dot uh, plus two times omega p squared theta one. I'm just faithfully copying that plus new terms. And the new terms are uh, two omega d theta one dot and the cosine term is one. So that just gives me omega d theta two dot equals zero. Observe the dimensional sensibility. Theta dot is one over second squared. Uh, theta double dot is one over second squared. Theta one is just radians. So this actually is radians per second squared. Uh, this is one over second squared and that is one over seconds and that is one over seconds. So it all makes sense dimensionally. Let's also write down the equation two dissipated. It'll be this equation plus additional terms. These are the additional terms. I'm gonna put cosine of theta one minus theta two equals one. So I just have omega dissipation, uh, theta two dot plus omega dissipation, theta one dot equals zero. Now, now we'll play the same game with the Euler ansatz. Last time we had the Euler ansatz and I was uh, careful enough to write even the first derivatives, which will come off use now. So we will use the same Euler ansatz again. Reuse the Euler ansatz. All right, I wanna see everything. So I'll keep this right there and I'll keep the equations right below and now I'll substitute. So those terms will look the same and these are the new terms. So we'll have to just modify the new terms. So I get negative two theta one zero omega squared, negative theta two zero omega squared plus two omega pendulum squared theta one zero uh, plus two omega dissipation times I omega theta one zero uh, plus I omega times omega dissipation theta two zero equals zero. That's the first equation. The second equation is negative theta two zero uh, omega squared minus theta one zero omega squared. So these are the same terms. And then plus omega pendulum squared theta two zero. And then I have the new terms. The new terms are gonna be this and that. So that's gonna be omega dissipation times I omega uh, theta two zero plus omega dissipation times I omega theta one zero. 
all that is equal to zero. So those are my new equations. Um, I have to say they look more complicated as they should so, because it's dissipation. Air resistance makes things not so pretty. I can still write it in the same matrix form. So let me do that. The matrix form is gonna be negative two omega squared plus two omega p squared. You'll notice that it's almost the same, but there's now extra terms times i and then minus omega squared. That's what you would have had. But now there's also this i omega omega d term. The symmetry of the metric tensor is not ruined even with air resistance. So that's worthy of note. Those are the old terms and then you have a new term. All times theta one zero, theta two zero, the new eigenvectors equals zero. By the same Kramer's rule, we have to use a determinant equal to uh, zero to solve it. But now we'll make a simplifying assumption. And that assumption is that I'm gonna assume that for the interest of time, that omega p is the same as omega d and it's equal to one. These are parameters that can be controlled by your experiment. Omega p is the natural frequency of the pendulum. By adjusting the length, you can, and adjusting the system of units, you can make it equal to one, okay? It'll be one per second. Adjusting your planet and adjusting the length or adjusting the length or both, you can make that equal to one. Dissipation, again, you can play around with the medium in which the thing is going and you can, again, uh, fine tune that to be one. If I do that, then the determinant equation I have to solve becomes the following. That just becomes two. So I'm putting omega d equals one there. And then omega p is one. Uh, this I did in the in the privacy of my uh, office. So I'm just gonna give you the answer. Uh, this is gonna be, uh, it, it'll take me one more page to write down all the details. So I'll just give you the answer. Uh, if you don't trust me, please work it out for yourself. And I did not even wanna touch this with a 10 foot pole. So what I did was I used Wolfram Alpha, which is a free software uh, available to you. And I uh, found the solutions. So I get omega equals half uh, plus or minus the square root of seven plus or minus four root two plus i. This plus i is extremely interesting. It is what gives you the decay. The reason is the following. The solutions theta i, where i equals one and two, are going to be of the form, so this i is not to be confused with the square root of minus one, by the way. It's of the form e to the i, and that's the square root of minus one, uh, omega t. So because omega is that, I'm going to get e to the plus or minus i times this part. Because of the plus or minus sign, I'm going to get uh, half times the square root of seven plus or minus four root two times t. So plus for one mode and minus for one mode. This plus or minus gives you sines and cosines. That plus or minus gives you mode one and mode two. The mode one and mode two are the same two modes. The two mode when the two pendula are the same, displaced and the two pendulas are crossed. The, those modes are the same. So the inner plus minus is that. The outer plus minus is just sine or cosine. And then that's uh, I e to the I times I. Well, that's negative one. So that's e to the minus half T. So that's your Oscillation. I'll, I'll say oscillatory, and that's DK. So you, for this at least, this choice of uh, omega p and omega d, you're seeing the classic damped oscillator behavior. So if I were to Uh, 
that's a specific case. I have uh, the specific case is that. And, and so what I'll do now is sketch for you the profile of the oscillation. That's the least I can do to round out this problem. So whether you're looking at theta one or theta two, they can be sketched as a function of time. So this uh, decay term, the exponential decay term is going to create a envelope that comes from the e to the minus half t. Uh, that's a plot of e to the minus half t. And then everything else is going to be sines and cosines. I purposely chose to hit the axis there because the initial conditions are not given in this problem. So eventually, after a long time, the pendulum's oscillation will die out. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a complete solution to the problem of the double pendulum without and with dissipation. <clears throat>